Good afternoon. My name is A. Tony Young. I'm executive director and founder of Community Education Group and co-founder of the Rural Health Service Providers Network. I often don't do an intro to the videos that we post uh, because I don't think that they're needed. Uh, I think that one of the things that's going to happen with this conversation that we're having about harm reduction and syringe service programs in West Virginia is that we're going to see that there are passionate people on both sides of the of the issue. And I think that in order for us to truly address harm reduction, to deconstruct the silo which exists between viral hepatitis, substance use disorder, and HIV in the state of West Virginia, and dare I say across rural America, it's going to take all of us and it's going to take differing opinions and those of us working in different sectors. Some of us will be working in needle exchange programs or SSPs. Some of us will be working in policy organizations and, and healthcare organizations and MAT groups and in the health department and the state health department and our federal legislature. Our goal has to be wherever we come from or however we come to uh, our support for people who use drugs, uh, for the elimination of viral hepatitis, for access to hep C and HIV treatment, and substance use disorder treatment, and be other behavioral health treatment. However we come to it, I think the most important thing is for us to remember that everybody has an opinion. We have to respect these opinions, and our goal, our goal has to be better public health for those in West Virginia and those across rural America. So I want to thank you, and I know that this video at some points gets intense, but um, it's about all of us, and it's for all of us. Uh, thank you again uh, for participating in the work that we do in West Virginia and across the United States and abroad. Ciao. All right, we are exactly at 2 p.m. So first and foremost, I uh, wanna thank you all for taking time uh, out of your busy day uh, to spend a little bit of time with us uh, and to have what I'm hoping will be a community conversation about harm reduction, SSPs, viral hepatitis, substance use disorder, and HIV in, in West Virginia. Uh, I first want to introduce who our panelists are, and A, I always tell people we do um, uh, everything that we can to make sure that we can have community participation from a number of levels. So uh, we've got Delegate Barbara, uh, Barbara, and we've got Delegate Mike, uh, so uh, I'm, I'm happy that you guys are here. We've got uh, Charlie Fox, uh, who's here. We, Laura Jones is not here and may be here later. She had a medical emergency. She called me this morning. Um, we've got Stacy Kay from SOAR. Uh, hopefully we've got Robin Pellini, uh, who many of you know, who does uh, academic and community-based participatory practice research. Uh, we've got Councilwoman uh, Deanna, and we've got Stephanie, and we've got Susan, and we've got one more person. Uh, hang on, I can't. Uh, and we've got Monique Tula. How could I have forgotten Monique Tula? Uh, hey, so, um, you know, the, the first and most important thing, this is the question that we've gotten um, about even doing this. The, the first question is really, Marcus, can you take all of that stuff down? And I'm going to talk a minute uh, about one of the first questions that we've gotten. And the first question, and Monique, I know you have to kind of go, so I'm going to be, and you're like, how'd I get the, how'd I get in the hot seat so soon? Uh, Monique Tua is the executive director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, they do work both domestically, I think, and internationally. They're responsible right now for the HEP Connect grant. Uh, which is uh, providing resources in West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and all throughout Appalachia to support harm reduction, uh, SSPs, viral hepatitis elimination. 
So Monique, here's a question that I've gotten uh, since we even said we were gonna do this. What is harm reduction and how is it different from needle exchange programs? Well, I would say that syringe service programs or needle exchange programs are, first of all, can you hear me? Cause I was having some technical difficulties. Okay, cool. Um, that syringe service programs or needle exchange programs are all harm reduction, but not all harm reduction programs are syringe service programs. Ah. So, you know, just, you know, like at a high level, heart, the harm reduction model rejects this all or nothing approach to sobriety because it's just not practical for um, everybody who uses drugs. So as a philosophy, or an approach, we aim to meet people where they are, harm reduction programs, whether it's a syringe service program or not, is uh, they're a place of connection and safety, even uh, if somebody is not ready to get sober. And it's really important to recognize that there's not just one approach to harm reduction for people with substance use disorders. At its core, harm reduction is focused on keeping people safe, again, whether they're ready to abstain from drugs or alcohol. Now, syringe service programs, naloxone distribution, these are, you know, two examples of, you know, the uh, sort of most popular forms of harm reduction. These are the programs that are at the front line of the overdose crisis, HIV and hepatitis C. These are programs that work directly with people who are most at risk, and they are in our first line of defense against overdoses. And um, I can't talk about this without acknowledging COVID, right? Um, you know, in the first three months of last year of 2020, before all of the mass shut down, overdose rates had already increased across the country more than 16 and a half percent. And now nearly all states and, and district uh, and DC have reported significant increases of overdoses. So this pandemic has compounded barriers to accessing and implementing harm reduction strategies um, like uh, syringe service programs and overdose prevention centers, but also peer, deli peer delivered outreach um, access to medication for opioid disorder like buprenorphine and methadone. So, you know, while it is true that total abstinence and sobriety is the best way to keep from the negative consequences of addiction, but, you know, until someone is ready to stop using, there really are other ways that they can protect themselves and their communities before they're totally sober. So an, a harm reduction approach to treatment provides information and resources to people in a non-judgmental way. So for example, a person who's enrolled in treatment might focus on learning how to cope with stressors in a more healthy way. They might get treatment for underlying mental health conditions or counseling for trauma that are contributing to their substance use. Um, it could also connect them with doctors and community resources that are also um, able to help with sobriety. So in this way, harm reduction really does uh, uh, empower people, even those who are still using, gives them tools, resources that they need to make lasting changes in their lives. And so, you know, so this is the good news about this is that it's my party. So I get to kind of set the rules of, of how I do this. So Here's my question for you, Monique, and, and maybe other people can jump in and maybe Robin Fellini can jump in on this too, is that, so, hey, you know, one of the things that I, I think I see in West Virginia, but I see across other jurisdictions is that we don't have our MAT providers really engaged in our harm reduction work, right? So when people, I think, think about harm reduction, they either think, you know, kind of yes or no. Yes, you are either an SSP or you're not. And so you're not a harm reductionist. But I think in, in communities like West Virginia, uh, MAT providers, that, that buprenorphine provider is really touching that per, uh, individual consumer a lot. So how do we do more to get them engaged in harm reduction work or seeing it as 
seeing the MAT provider as a part of a continuum of care of, of harm reduction, which is what I think. I, let me just let me be honest. That's what I think. I think MAT is on this, that harm reduction is a continuum of substance use disorder care. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, um, Tony. You know, some people, you know, I hear, I hear this uh, a lot at, you know, at first glance, uh, folks see harm reduction, the harm reduction approach as, as enabling, right? We hear this uh, an awful lot, you know, but really it's not about encouraging people substance use. Instead, you know, harm reduction programs like MAT, we, we want to be able to touch people as often as possible, right? To have them in contact with folks as much as possible. So harm reduction programs can, can serve to this bridge, you know, can be a bridge to treatment, housing, mental health care. You know, it's this approach that acknowledges the reality of people's lives that using drugs can be deadly. And that by raising the rock bottom, right? And helping somebody before they're entirely sober, you could very well save a life. So the more opportunities we have to engage with people, the more opportunities we actually have to save lives. And, so I'll pause there and let the folks from West Virginia, the experts from West Virginia chime in. Right, and maybe, and maybe uh, Dr. Bissett, this is where you can jump in because I think that Monique kind of leads with what I think my next question is or what I think a part of the, the challenge for us is, is that it's like when we talk about community, who are we talking about, right? Because if we're talking about a harm reduction community, like in my mind, we're talking about everyone from the user to the policy, to the MAT facility, to the, in our case here in West Virginia, also that would be our health departments that are providing uh, uh, services as SSPs, our politicians who we need. So I think it's all of them when I think of, a, of, of community. And I know that you just had a piece, uh, Dr. Visit in the paper that I think really kind of hit on the question around Whose community are we talking about? What community are we talking about serving when we talk about servicing them? Yeah, I would I would just respond to that by saying I think that um, when we talk about community, we are talking about all those things. We're talking about all the people that live in that community. We're also talking about the community of people who are in active addiction, right? And and trying to address. Um, that from a, a place of compassion. Uh, but I also think there's a lot of education that needs to happen within the community that sometimes we overlook with very good intentions. And sometimes that can create some controversy. So one of the things that we've tried to do just over the course of the last month is try to garner community response um, from all angles. Uh, in terms of what some views are of, of harm reduction to help determine how we can better move the conversation forward. And that's really where our focus has been. Um, and it's interesting to see responses from people who are in different occupations. Um, I think it's also been interesting in our community how our medical community, our healthcare community has kind of stepped up now and made a statement about harm reduction, which is something that we were significantly lacking uh, before. And so to have, um, you know, two hospital systems and two health systems, two additional health systems or facilities come out and make a formal statement, I think is huge. And then it's how do we move forward from there? Um, and, and that's really where I think the conversation is at right now in Charleston. So, okay, so you think it's exactly where? Sum it up for me. Talk to me like I'm two. I, I mean, I, I, I look smart in my um, my Bill, uh, what's not Bill Gates, but uh, Steve Jobs <laughs> sweater and my Steve Jobs glasses, but I've not invented an iPhone. Um, so, so what do you think the issue is in Charleston or in West Virginia? I think the issue in a lot of ways is, you know, you have to combat uh, concerns about public safety, right? So the biggest public safety concern we hear about is needle litter. So how do we address needle litter? 
Um, I, I'm kind of of the thought that you're going to have needle litter, rather whether you have harm reduction or not. So let's take a look at how we address that needle litter. I'm going to jump in. Is it we're going to have syringe litter if we have needle exchange or not, not if we have harm reduction or not. You see, right. So I think it's really important that we start uh, talking about what we're talking about, yep, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Right? So, and I and I think that people are challenged because it's like so. And and, and I, I this is kind. Of, I, hopefully, you watched the videos and you saw how these calls go. Yeah, so you, you knew that this was a possibility. Um, but want to see? So one of the questions that we have here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read the whole question because see, I think that words matter. Right, and so when people talk about harm reduction and SSPs in the same breath, I think that's where some of the confusion may lie, uh, because they're not the same thing. Like I said, one's a continuum of the other, uh, and so uh, Ashley uh, Switzer, I, I may have mispronounced your name, uh, says the controversial component of harm reduction is the needles. Do all harm reduction programs offer needles? And if so, why? If not, why? Uh, it's my understanding that federal funds cannot be used for needles. However, harm, redu harm reduction programs are grant funded. And so uh, Ashley, I think we're talking about exactly your question. There's a distinction between harm reduction and SSP. SSPs, right, are one thing, and harm reduction programs, which generally have an underlying component of education, linkage to care, access. Uh, those are the things that you see in harm reduction programs, whereas in the needle exchange program, that's one program or one component thereof, and you are correct. There is currently a federal ban on the purchase um, uh, syringes with federal funds, not with uh, your private money. If I want to buy some, I could, I guess, um, but I'm not going to because I'm not going to. Um, so Robin, I'm going to pick on you on that one. So yes. help, 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 help me explain this to Ashley. Yeah. Um well, I'll just explain it in general, but I'm sorry, I've had some battery issues and I had to jump up and jump off and jump on again. So can you just um, sort of very succinctly rephrase the question or repeat the question? You're on mute. You're on mute. The question is, the question is, hey, look, uh, why, why are we paying for harm reduction programs, right? And why are we paying for the needles? And I'm saying one is that there's a distinction between harm reduction programs and needle exchange programs. And then the question is, hey, the, I'll re, I'm gonna read it specific directly verbatim so I don't mess it up. It's my understanding that federal funds cannot be used for needles. However, harm reduction programs are grant funded. They're two different things. And I'm trying to kind of make this distinction so we don't get stuck here because I think people get stuck here. And I'm going to get back to Susan's cleanup question. And Monique Tool is jumping at the bit right now. So I'm going to. I'll let Monique go because she can speak to this, but I'll just say, yeah, as long as I've been doing this work, there's been a federal ban on using federal funds to buy injection equipment. So when, so all syringe services programs use private or some other separate funds to buy syringes, the money that comes from grants generally goes for infrastructure and staffing. Um, but the other part of your question was, why should we pay for the grants, right? And the question, and the answer is that you pay for it because it's good public health, but it also saves money. So if the if it doesn't compel you to, you know, support the health of people who use drugs and members of your community because they are, then you can also do it because it saves extraordinarily and extraordinarily large amounts of money. Um, and that's been quantified in West Virginia with regard to a number of things, including endocarditis. So our hospitals spend millions of dollars each year paying for unreimbursed costs. That this isn't the argument that, that I like to lead with, um, but it is cost effective in addition to just being good public health. Thanks. Uh, Charlie Fox, what about you?
Okay, can you hear me? Perfect. Um, so what what exactly would you like me to speak to? I would like you to speak to the harm reduction versus SSPs. What I'm, what I'm really trying to get to in this first few minutes before I lose Monique is the, the unique differences in the two. And like I say, I think words matter. So when people say, hey, you got a harm reduction program and you should get your money taken. Well, no, oh, okay. I mean, I'm educating people I'm educating people about substance use disorder. I might be doing linkages to care. I might be addressing housing or homelessness. I might be addressing a whole bunch of things. I may not, I may never give out a syringe, but I might be a harm reduction program, right? And I think Robin said it very well, is that the idea of harm reduction is sound public health. In order to get people to get screened and vaccinated for COVID, we are going to have to use a harm reduction model. That model is going to have to be one where we start to talk to people about the impact of what they do on their families, on their communities, on their neighborhoods. Harm reduction is very much the same thing. It is what can we give you to get you where you are right now, right? So with COVID, for people sometimes in rural and red states, we're not going to we're not going to change their minds of how they feel about the vaccine, but we might be able to change their mind with an understanding of how they feel about family, community, neighbor. That I, I guess the issue is Tony that I and, and I think Joe Solomon Solomon typed this in the chat, and I thought it was a really good comment. Is I'm I'm not sure that we have very many programs, syringe service programs in op, in West Virginia that are operating under the harm reduction model. So it, it kind of feels like we're splitting hairs about that issue in West Virginia, um, because again, I don't I don't know of any SSPs in West Virginia that aren't operating under a harm reduction model where there's well, the, well, wait a minute. What about the other way? Or my point is the other way around. Can I be a harm reduction program that's not an SSP? Sure, I'm just not sure how many of those we have. Uh, well, maybe Monique can speak to this too, but I and Monique, you know, maybe other people on this call were doing syringe exchange and syringe service before the term harm reduction existed, okay? So it used to be just syringe services programs. And the term harm reduction came about to represent the fact that those programs usually do a lot more than just distributing syringes. They do all these other things that you talked about, which is linkage to care, treating abscesses, doing HIV and hep C testing and all these other things. And that's where that term came from. Now, for me, having come up in that history, if you're not doing syringe distribution, I don't consider that to be a harm reduction program in my context where I work. And so one of the concerns I have is that the term harm reduction has been expanded to address a whole lot of things, including programs that are working with people who use drugs but don't provide access, access to syringes or naloxone. Um, and maybe that's just my personal angle from having come up through the years with these different terms, but I, I do find it confusing. Yeah, thanks. I, I would actually um, just push back on that a little bit. I think that there are plenty of harm reduction programs that I would call harm reduction programs that actually don't um, distribute syringes. And I say that because to your point, some of the earliest harm reduction programs were syringe service programs. And they came about, it was in direct response to the fact that HIV AIDS was, um, uh, you know, we were seeing huge spikes of HIV infection among people who use drugs and there was nobody who was uh, really doing anything about it. And so uh, Edith Springer, who was one of the, you know, the, the, the founders of harm reduction in this country, went to uh, Europe, learned about syringe service programs, brought it here as a way to mitigate the impact of HIV among people who inject drugs. But here's the rub. The rub is that people often associate harm reduction with heroin use 
and injection drug use. And the reality, right, is that there are thousands of different different ways that you can use drugs and admit, you know, types of drugs and administration of drugs, right, that don't have a needle. I might be over, you know, speaking like thousands of ways, I don't know. But uh, my point is that by focusing exclusively on needles and syringes, we are effectively sort of erasing the, the fact that there are people who are not injecting drugs and still need to keep themselves safe um, from whatever harms are associated from whatever drug they happen to be using. Smoking crack, crystal meth, snorting cocaine, um, you know. So, so I do want to, I just want to make that distinction that where, you know, while syringe service programs were some of the earliest forms of harm reduction, harm reduction is much bigger than that. And in fact, there's harm reduction housing programs now, right? Um, I would say, you know, we talked a little bit about um, buprenorphine and methadone. Those are forms of harm reduction. The whole idea is just recognizing that if someone is not ready to stop using, they still have the right to be seen as whole human beings. You know, we recognize that the opposite of addiction is not abstinence. In fact, the opposite of addiction is connection. And so whatever connection we can provide, that will go a long way to helping reduce stigma and just breathe a little bit of humanity back in, you know, into our, our daily interaction. Thank you for clarifying that, I think, um, and that helps me to explain it better here, because what I've encountered here in West Virginia is someone will say, oh, I have a harm reduction program, and then I say, great, tell me more about that, and it's a detox program, right? Um, and so, yeah, if you're engaging people who are in active drug use in a way that supports them in protecting their health, then yeah, so I can explain that a little bit better. Thank you, Monique. And so one of the things that keeps coming up in the chat and in my email box when I said this is syringe litter. And so here's the thing that I, I kind of think, right? What I think is, and, I, and again, this is my, my call so I can say what I think, right, Robin? So, um, so what I think is this, I think that, you know, we look at the issue of litter, the syringe litter, and then that becomes a political football, I think. And I'm sure Mike and uh, I think where'd Barbara go? I think I think you guys are probably hearing it about the litter and about the distribution and all of that. But then I wonder then, so, okay, let's, let's say hypothetically uh, Representative Tar's bill goes and passes, all of a sudden, you still should be putting in some sort of bill that addresses cleanup and, uh, and it gives those resources to those organizations on the ground, because I think that that litter is still going to be there and it's probably going to be there in a greater volume, not less of one. So I, I think that we should be thinking about the, the cleanup and the community cleanup as a part of harm reduction is how I see it. I see that if you can collect those syringes, if you can get other uh, community partners, particularly small business partners to be points of either where you can drop off of, dispose of syringes uh, on a larger scale, uh, a McDonald's, a uh, Dollar General. You, you, we won't go down my Dollar General story, story again. Um, but I think that that's a, another piece of maybe what we should be thinking about doing proactively is making a request and a demand that there be a grant for cleanup. Um, whether you, And that's what harm reduction is due to. They clean stuff up. I don't know a harm reduction program that frankly has not left the community better uh, when they left it than when they when they started in it. Uh, and Monique, are you reaching for your mute button? Yes, good. Go ahead, Monique. 
I know. Is, this I is, mean, I wasn't, but you know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm here I, calling I you, Monique and Mike. I want you to get ready because I'm coming to you about introducing the bill for cleanup. Go ahead. Yeah, just just thinking about cleanup. You know, uh, over the it's controversial, right? So harm reductionists over the years, I think, have taken a, a reformist stance around uh, harm reduction. I do think it's time for us to to look at it a little bit differently. Um, you know, we have facilitated conversations and trainings over the years with law enforcement to help improve the interactions, you know, between law enforcement personnel and syringe service and harm reduction programs and people who use drugs. The whole goal <clears throat> is to help build those relationships to reduce friction and, 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 you know, enhance awareness. And really, it's about developing mutually beneficial working partnerships. You know, but we know that police and other first responders have legitimate concern um, about injection drug use, right? So there's, you know, police in some jurisdictions, I'm not quite sure about in West Virginia, but in some jurisdictions noted that uh, like more than 50% of their, of their uh, you know, teams <clears throat> deal with people who have mental health and uh, substance use related crimes, right? So it's a huge part of what they do every day. Some have been stuck with needles while frisking, right? Making them vulnerable to HIV and, and Hep C. And, you know, we all know this, uh, well, I won't even go on about the, the, the fentanyl situation, but, you know, cause I have questions about it. But, um, you know, the, but, the, but the fact is that syringe service programs are not exclusive, it's not just about distributing needles. Like every syringe service program that I've ever come into contact with has a component where they are going out into the community and removing litter, right? So it's a huge public health benefit. These are programs that can help address discarded syringes, right? Um, that help keep the entire community safe, law enforcement, first responders, safe from needle, needle stick injuries. And it potentially you know, can diffuse the, the issues, if you think about it in this way, can diffuse the issues that are related to syringe service uh, programs. Um, you know, really sort of the idea here is that they're providing this additional community uh, public health service um, in addition to providing linkage to care um, services to people who use drugs. Uh Okay, so Barbara and Mike, what are you hearing in, on the legislative front? Should we be worried? Is this tar bill coming back? Uh, are you open to having some independent uh, litter cleanup legislation come in if the community were to kind of work with you to craft it and propose it? Um, you know, because, um, yeah. And I've got I've got Deanna McKinney. Kenny, uh, she's raising her hand, so I'm going to bring her in here in a minute, also. But let me get them, and then uh, Ms. McKinney, I'll get right to you. Barbara, would you like to go first? You want me to go first? Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me on, and I, I really appreciate it because I've I've been just really trying to listen and learn. Um, one of the reasons why I ran for public office in the first place uh, is because of just drug policy in general, not just harm reduction, but also in regards to uh, law enforcement, in regards to uh, prevention, in regards to treatment, uh, because I'm also I'm a person in long term recovery. Now, how that does influence every decision I make, because that's who I am in regards um, to types of harm reduction, I do have to often take a step back and not let it influence uh, my decision making so much and not react on emotion, but also listen to the public health experts, which I am not, I'm definitely not a public health expert. But because of my life experience, that's, that led me uh, to run because of certain types of harm reduction, were, which at the time were misunderstood in regards to the state expanding access to naloxone. Uh, that's one of the first things that we worked on um, in 2015 when or after. At, not long after I was elected, we got back to working on expanding um, access to naloxone, which is harm reduction. We passed a bill in 2015, uh, Good Samaritan law, that, that uh, granted uh, certain types of immunity from prosecution for people who would call 
911 if they were with somebody who overdosed. Uh, I think that's something that the state should talk about more. We passed the law, but we haven't done the, the proper public information campaign behind it to let people know that they can make that phone call, which was a bill that was meant to save lives. That's harm reduction. Um, now, what we should be looking for on a, on a state level um, in regards uh, to this current issue, I think that there's often a, a, a reaction to something. Um, we didn't, and, you know, to tell you the truth in Charleston, where I represent a district in Charleston, we didn't hear, we've had, we had, the health department had the syringe program for several years. Now, I remember when they were first talking about it, a, uh, somebody from the Metro Drug Unit, a uh, law enforcement officer came and spoke to some of us who were in office at the time and told us what they were doing, why they were doing it. And it was clearly because uh, if, if, if we don't, uh, we are going to be paying for it down the road with the huge outbreak of HIV and Hep C. Um, and he said, we're not having a ribbon cutting. We're not going to talk about it. And it was kind of a warning, let's not make this political. And we did a fairly good job of that until, in my opinion, until the last mayoral election when it became a political issue. And that's when it really, that, that's when it became uh, more of a hot button issue around in this area. I know there's uh, 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 Councilwoman uh, McKinney's on here and Councilwoman Steele's on here also as, as well. They you know, chime in or correct me if I'm wrong. Um, as far as statewide legislation goes, I do think that they're to look for some sort of reaction, whether it's a statewide prohibition. Um, I, I don't think that uh, prohibition of any kind, if you look at American history, has, has been very effective. And uh, the other one would be a, um, I've heard of a bill that would give more power to the county commission uh, over rules of their health department. Um, personally, I like to keep, you know, public health decisions in the hands of the professionals. Um, I, I don't want to see this politicized, and that's why I've, you know, thus far really stayed out of it. But uh, I'm, you know, I think it should be decisions left in the hand of the people who have studied it and in the public health officials. But uh, I'll go ahead and let somebody else chime in. Thanks. Well, um, Tony, I'd, I'd love to share what little bit I know about this. I serve on the board of the Milan Pushkar Health Rights Center. And we, and I've served on that board probably 20 years and we've had a harm reduction program for five and a half years. I think ours was the first in the state and ours also used the quiet approach. Um, and we've been lucky that we haven't had what's happened in Charleston with the politicization of it. Um, we have been, we've only had six cases of HIV infection as a result of in, in Mon County compared to the 50 that have been in Kanawha and we've had no needle sticks. Um, so, and, and when I talk to Laura Jones and I don't see her on here and she's my go-to person and- she's not, She had a medical emergency. So oh, she's she, trying to Well, as far as I'm concerned, she's a saint. I agree. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, she, what she said was that our, uh, exchange makes a concerted effort to deal with the needles and that most of them are in abandoned houses. I think anything we could do to say, let's approach the cleanup issue would be good, but we don't have that much of a cleanup issue in Mon County. What um, I've looked, actually, I wasn't even aware that those bills were um, being taken up last year because on the house side, I was totally busy with putting out fires and Mike probably was too. I mean, I, I wasn't really aware of how it affected things that I know a little bit about. Um, and I see that there were two bills last year, one from Delegate Mant, who has a different punitive approach and then the other ban from Senator Tarr. Of course, Tarr has been elevated to the um, position of, um, finance chair, although this is not a finance issue. And last year, it, and, and we don't know how things are gonna be this year exactly, whether there will be, um, last year, both bills were double referenced. 
um, in the, the House bill went to the um, Substance Abuse Committee that Mike serves on and then to health and on the Senate side, it went to the Health Commission Committee and then to Judiciary. There are health care providers who um, are very important backstops who know better. And um, sometimes it's good to think about an inside game and an outside game. I mean, Charleston's got an outside game and, and you need to participate in that game. But the most effective way to kill this is on the inside game. And, um, you know, in, in Charleston and Southern West Virginia, you have um, Tom Takubo, who's the majority leader and Ron Stallings, both of them. I think we're involved last year. I don't know that personally, but I'm guessing. And then we have healthcare providers um, who are critical on the, on the house side. I would think Matt Rohrbach, who is the vice chair of health. Mike, is he on that um, substance abuse committee also? He um, probably is. He's no longer the chair of the committee, but he still serves on the Still's committee. Still's on it. And then I'm thinking, Amy Summers might also quietly be helpful because she's a nurse. She works in an emergency room. I don't know. I've never talked to her about this issue. Um, I think that all, it might, I think every effort should be made to kill this bill. And it might not be a bad idea to um, work on that cleanup. I, I'm, I'm okay with that, but I think that my energies and probably most of yours are better spent in killing this and um, and saving the lives. Like Laura said, you know, what our syringe exchange program is a nalo naloxone delivery program. That's how it's get given out. We had a great big encampment and we reversed a whole lot of overdoses at that encampment because of this harm reduction program. And, um, you know, of course we need to talk about it. We need to explain what you're saying, what it really is. Um, but I think we need to try to nip this in the bud if we possibly can. And I'm open to the, to the, um, the idea of some kind of a collection thing, but you know, we're in the super minority. So, um, and it's not gonna be a lot of money. You know, maybe, maybe this could be something um, administrative, Tony, through DHHR. I think you were thinking about doing it as a public way to explain we're taking care of this part of the problem. But, uh, right. you know, I mean, I think for me, I think that we, um, and I'm going to bring in uh, Councilwoman uh, uh, Deanna here now. Uh, are you here? Because I don't see you, but I want to hear yeah. you. Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, I, uh, and so I know that you have some concerns specifically about particularly litter and distribution in African-American communities in uh, Charleston. Am I, am I, do I have, did I summarize that correctly? Um, kind of, my, uh, I appreciate you guys including me on this call. And um, just from my last visit, um, there's been a lot of emails, a lot of things, a lot of disrespect. And I think that um, this conversation has taken a total different turn. And I think, um, it needs to calm down a little bit. And I think people need to respect everybody's differences and not including source. I've been getting emails, phone calls, um, on social media, disrespecting me, talking about I'm not a Christian. And um, I find it very offensive that an organization comes into a community without the community knowing and is doing something like that, especially on the world where there's high rate of crime and drugs, period to have a program like that and not give the community a heads up that you're coming into their community to bring more confusion because people that work these programs actually don't live in these communities that they come in. And that's the problem that I'm having because when I went to an event, I didn't see anything that targeted the African-American community problem with drugs. So when you say harm reduction, it should be harm reduction for all 
not just picking one particular illness. So I have a problem with that. And I also have a problem with the fact that we as human beings, um, we wake up and we have all these different emotions. We have all these different things going on in our personal lives um, as well as in our communities. And instead of a conversation, we automatically come up with these ideas or these things and just run with it without getting the proper consultation. And any type of program, especially if you're working in the streets and not in the building, you need to communicate with those people that live in those areas. I think that was very disrespectful that nobody communicated with the, the community. So to say that it's about politics on my end is not. It's about people and it's about respect. And like I said, I didn't see anything to help the African-American community, but you're in an African, uh, African community group. I mean, you're in a community where it's never African-Americans really, um, mainly selling drugs. So if you got a drug dealer on this side of the street, you got a drug user on this side of the street and they getting tools to use the drugs, but what about the tools for these uh, drug dealers? What's, what's going on with that? Do they get a pardon because they're selling people drugs? Do they get a, a pat on the back because, hey, this person's an illness and you're giving them drugs to make them feel better? No, it doesn't work like that. So I think that this conversation should have been on the level of everybody being included, harm reduction including all drug activity, not just one, harm reduction including everybody, not just some. And I think that's where the whole big problem came in that nobody sat down and had a conversation with community members, community leaders to introduce the program like this into a community so where we can see if it's beneficial for that particular community or not. So to say that, hey, we have high rates of HIV, it's been like that since the 80s. HIV has been rising high before this whole drug thing from sex, from other things like HIV has always been high from uh, same sex. Ooh, so, I mean, it's all different kind of things. So I don't think that you could just say, hey, let's give out needles because it's raising um, HIV. Because even with hepatitis, I didn't see no testing for hepatitis or no vaccines for hepatitis. You could give out vaccines for hepatitis. I mean, it's certain things that we could do to kind of bring stuff down, but it has to be a conversation with everybody. And I think any organization that comes up with a harm reduction program any community you go in, it's only right that you talk with the people in the community. Because like I said, a lot of those people that come there volunteering don't live there. So you don't really see the aftermath, even though you're doing a good deed and you're trying to save lives, you don't see the other lives that's being destroyed when you leave. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration. And especially with the way, and I, I, I would really appreciate for Source to, cause the articles I'm reading and everything you know, with um, my name in it, like I'm against harm reduction, I'm just, I'm, and that's not true. And I think that that's caused a lot of more confusion with anybody trying to even understand it is the bad publicity that people's getting just because they speaking up or speaking how they feel. And the same way you want us to respect how you feel about saving lives, respect how we feel about how lives is being saved is a two way street. And I think respect goes on both sides. And, and I just really want to say that because it's been really hard for me with the social media, I've been feeling very disrespected by source uh, message as far as like we are this and we are that. It's not about politics for me. It's about people for me. And they was in my ward handing out needles and about it right up the block from where I stay at. And I didn't know nothing about it. But like I said, when I went there, it was nothing there for the African-American community, but sure in our community giving out needles, bringing extra people in this community. And it's people that don't even live in that community that was coming in for needles. So all those things need to be taken into consideration. I didn't see no accountability. How do you keep up? How do you know if somebody's actually getting help? Like, where is the actual accountability at on that end? Like, so it's so many things that we could do to make this a better program. But I think the first thing is to respect each other's differences, respect each other's opinion, and to communicate with the people that we care about and that we want to work with. Because without communication, it's always going to be about politics instead of people. And, and Councilwoman uh, McKinney, I think that you are articulating the reason why we're having this call. Uh, because we, you know, people do have different opinions. And so that's thing one. Thing two is I would love to follow up with you uh, about kind of maybe what we can do to have some sort of either online or, or post-COVID uh, in-person 
conversation. And I know uh, Stacy's here, Joe's here, and Brooke's here uh, from SOAR. And I'm going to ask them to say that they would be open to that conversation as as well. And I think that that's and I think you I think you're hitting the nail on the head. Why I want to do this. I didn't think that everybody on this call would agree with each other 100 percent. But I, you know, I come to this and I say, number one, we've got to respect each other's differences, differences of opinions and differences of approach. So what I want to do is with the SOAR people, let's figure out a program that might work. And is it is it that we use uh, CEG's ch uh, CHAMPS training program and what we do with some of those dudes that are slinging on the corner, train them how to do outreach, train them how to do HIV testing, train them how to do hep C testing and linkage to care. Let's figure out, if, is there a, something different that we can do to get them engaged in this process of, of, of helping our community be better? And so you know, I, I want to definitely thank you for, for being here. And like I say, everybody's not going to have the same opinion. Our goal has to be, how do we have a healthier whole community? Monique, I see you jump. You jumped on that. Yeah, time. I do. I need to, cause, and I apologize that I have to leave early, but I have another um, thing that I have to go to. The one thing I really, I, I love the idea um, that uh, a, a broader conversation has to happen with the community, right? I, I agree with that 100%. And I would go even further to say that the services that y'all are talking about, that we're all talking about, are actually targeting people who use drugs. And so my question is, how often are people who use drugs invited to conversations like this? How often is City Hall and all of the other municipal, you know, are, are, are municipal leaders actually inviting people who use drugs who are part of the broader community how many people here can raise their hand and say, nope, no one in my family has ever been touched by substance use, right? And how many people here who do have people who use drugs in their family and in their community can say, yes, actually, we go to them on a regular basis and say, how can we help? What would be the best thing for you that we could do in this community? So as you continue to have these conversations, if you're not inviting people to, who use drugs to the table, you're missing the mark. And with that, I got to bounce. But thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Monique. I'm so glad that Monique said that because one of my concerns when I saw the notice for this meeting is it's a community conversation, but we don't have anyone who is a person from West Virginia who uses drugs outwardly or injects drugs on the panel. So I, I just wanted to make that note. The second one is it's something that I've noticed that is really concerning is we do want to engage in the community because you provide the best services when you get input from the people that you're serving, right? If well, we Robert, build Robert, it- I want, I want to stop you. I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that you, I don't think that it's fair to say that there's no one on that panel, on this panel that uses drugs and that's in West Virginia or from West Virginia, lives in West Virginia. I don't think it's fair. They may not be publicly, have publicly disclosed that, but I don't think it's fair to say that. Sure, okay. But the other thing that I've observed is that when we talk about getting input from the community, people who inject drugs are, are never targeted as part of that. And so that's a real concern to me is we're, ta that we're talking about this without getting the input outwardly of people who have the most to gain or lose by whether these programs are allowed to function. And I think that's unfortunate. Can I say something, please? Who's that? I don't, I don't even know who it is. Um, oh. It's Emily Baldwin. I'm, I'm the Emily, yeah. uh, harm yeah. production yeah. coordinator yeah. at, at Milan Pushkar Health, right? Yes. Hey, so. Emily. Sorry, I didn't see you. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, how I'm staying you? off camera because I'm at home just lounging. Um, but so, yes, I see now someone is saying that they're in recovery. But yeah, so including people in the community is Sorry. absolutely important. Um, 
and when we started, because we did kind of a quiet open or whatever you want to call it, we did have a community advisory board that included some drug users and people in recovery and police officers and health professionals and everyone we could think of of every end of this. Um, and that made a difference as we saw how things, how they kind of unfolded and then we were able to start without making a big fuss about it, but we also did have community buy-in. But one important thing to remember is that this is a public health issue. And while community buy-in is absolutely important, um, no one needs the community's permission to address a public health issue, um, especially when it's related to the health departments who are or who are giving these services and it connected to these services. Um, so that's just something to think about that it's, um, we don't need permission, however, Yes, it's important for people to understand what's going on, but I think that all just goes to education and really educating the community on what harm reduction is. Um, and and the, yeah, I'm not really sure how else to go about that, but. Well, uh, no, I, I, think, I think that that's very important. I think that, and a couple of people have said this in the chat, is that I think some people are uh, very, uh, forward thinking and and very open and out, if you will, about their uh, drug use and about them using drugs now. I think some people are not so out uh, because there are there can be consequences to identifying yourself as a person who who uses drugs. Uh, it, period. Uh, there can be short term and long term uh, implications behind that. Uh, I think that. One of the things that we've seen in the harm reduction movement is there's a difference in how people of color who use drugs and are uh, activists in the harm reduction space get treated versus white people who use drugs in the harm reduction space and are activists and get treated. But I, you know, so I, you know, so I hear you and I and I completely agree that the voices of people who use drugs should be uh, lifted up, should be engaged, and should be heard. Uh, so with that, I'm first going to go to Stacy, then I'm going to go to Brooke, then I'm going to go to Stephanie, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the OTP moratorium, which nobody cares about but me. Stacy, Brooke. Hey there, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, I'm, I'm Stacy K. Um, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I've been with SOAR since the beginning. Um, and I was led to doing this uh, work through my personal experiences um, with substance use and through my love and loss of um, friends and family who are experiencing addiction and who uh and also injection related hiv um it's it's my privilege that allows me to be here um and i am grateful really to have this opportunity to hear and and learn and listen um to more about what people are doing in their communities um, to help others who may not feel safe to come forward um, because of the shame and the stigma that um, we face. Um, and especially with just abstinence only um, approaches to re recovery. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself um, I'm not sure if there was a particular question that you're asking me to speak to, Tony. Yeah. I just want you to speak to kind of maybe how this whole um, thing in Charleston has come up with SOAR, how it's impacting you, what y'all do, how can, how can, you know, you've got uh, Councilwoman uh, McKinney, uh, she's like open the conversation, it sounds like. You've got uh, other, you know, I've got Barbara, I've got Mike. I'm sorry I'm calling you by your first names, but it's too much for me to well, remember. I, I am really grateful. I think that um, I'm a longtime 
fan and friend of Deanna, Councilman, Councilwoman McKinney, and um, I consider her like my family. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for her and um, so hang on, Stacy. Can I? Can I? Can I? I have to interrupt because there's a whole there's a whole nother thing going on in the chat. Um, and thank so, so much, very is. Thank you so much for addressing that, ma'am. Because I was just looking I'm at sorry, it, and I'm, I'm very hurt chat. about that. I'm sorry. All right. So 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 let me let me let me let me jump in here. So um, I think we have about uh, I want to say about, I don't know, 60, 70 people on this call. So, I, you know, I, I'll go away from, uh, I will digress from my politically correct uh, position and moderator voice and tone and all of that stuff. Um, here's, my, here, here, here's my reality, right? My reality uh, is that we, we've seen an increase in overdoses in the state. My reality is that we have seen uh, a higher rate of uh, HIV, viral hepatitis, uh, substance use disorder uh, in the state. Uh, we've got only nine methadone programs uh, that are seeing people in the state that needs to change. We've got uh, media attention saying, um, let's get rid of, basically, let's get rid of harm reduction programs in, in, in Charleston and by virtue of that in the state. Um, but the problem is, is that we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, I got people that are uh, gonna get sick from COVID. I got people that are gonna get sick from uh, overdose. I got people that are going to get sick from HIV. I got people that are going to get sick from Hep C. And all this, in my opinion, is pretty much unnecessary at this point in in, in public health. We we can actually do this, but we actually have to do it together. We cannot do this like in isolation. And I can't do it. We can't do it. None of us can do it by saying drug users are bad, people who have a differing opinion are bad. Listen, this is not, people just have a different opinion, but at the end of the day, our job, our goal hopefully is to have happy, healthy communities in West Virginia. You know, I don't think that I agree with Robin Pellini 100% of the time. Uh, okay, Robin, I probably don't, but that's okay. I don't, I mean, I do agree 100% of the time with my good friend, Amy Snodgrass about everything. Um, but here's the thing, drug users have agency authority and rights too. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and I'm gonna say too, because other people who are not drug users have rights and authority and agency too. And that's what this whole thing is about, right? Is that we kind of got to figure out some equity here. There's equity in how we have to be respectful to Councilwoman McKinney, and we've got to be respectful to the people who use drugs. We've got to do both, and. We've got to do both, and. And so sitting in a chat saying somebody's bad or somebody's good or why, I mean, is because the reality is, is that drug users are also entitled to good, sound public health and good health care. Right. And people who don't use drugs are entitled to and are deserving of good, safe, clean community. Now, the question becomes, how do we do them both? And we do them both with equity. Right. So I'm going to say in a, in a, if, if this doesn't stop. Right. If it doesn't stop in the chat, I'll just turn the chat off and then you can't chat in there. But we shouldn't do that to one another. I don't have to agree with you politically. I don't have to agree with you at 100%, but I think we do all agree who are on this call, who took two hours out to do it. We agree that we want a better, healthier, well-tuned West Virginia. So Stacy, I'm sorry, now I've taken my license. 
Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Um, I just, real quick, um, since Monique isn't here, I just want to um, go back to some of what I've learned from Monique and um, the Harm Reduction Coalition and just mention that harm reduction at its foundation really is um, about social justice and com combating um, racism and stigma and marginalization and criminalization of, and of people who use drugs. Um, there's a long history behind it and I encourage everybody to, to take a look over there at their site and learn. They've got a lot of really great learning resources. And then I also wanna just share a quote um, from another organization that I find um, to really um, ground me in some of, some of the work that I'm doing. Um, and that is um, an organization called Faith in Harm Reduction. And um, this quote is that harm reduction is love that stands with awe at the hardships that people carry rather than standing in judgment of how they carry it. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Now I'm gonna ask uh, one person who doesn't know I'm gonna ask them to speak. I don't really need them to speak. Hey, Sarah, can you turn that baby around so I can calm these people down, please? Look at the baby, everybody. Look at the baby, <laughs> Look at the baby people. Look at the baby. All right? Look at the baby. Oh, what's the baby's name, Sarah? Her name is Austin. Oh, that's a cool name. Yeah. That's she's a cool uh, name. she's named from a, a dear friend of ours that passed away a little over a year ago uh, from liver failure due to alcoholism. So we were able to tell him before he passed away that if we were fortunate enough for Austin to be born, that that would be their name. And so here she is. And she is, and she's a pretty girl too. Thank that's you. A cool, that's, a cool, that's the coolest name too. And it's a cool story. Thank you, thank you very, very much, Sarah. All right, so uh, is Stephanie Lancaster still here? Yes, Stephanie Lancaster, tell these people who you are and what you do. You're on mute, but you know, that's how I like for you. Uh, that's how I like you to tell me a story. I thought you let, I thought you guys were all lip readers. So I'm a director of community health solutions for Emergent Biosolutions. Um, we're the company that manufactures and sells Narcan nasal spray. Um, I love the conversation about harm reduction because I, I on as a side project, I teach in middle schools and high schools about um, sexual assault response and um, sort of like not standing by for um, unconscionable behavior. And one of the things that I'm teaching in my middle school and high school programs is a broader de definition of harm reduction. And I include um, seat belts and I include your smoke detector and your um, carbon monoxide detector and I include sunscreen. I think harm reduction needs to be a conversation that we do normalize. And I don't think that normalizing, um, I don't think that normalizing is an enabler. There was some side chat about that too. I think normalizing is, is, is a really important concept that we're, a lot of us are just becoming really grounded in because of the pandemic. Um, so you'll hear, there was a great article about a year ago about it's, it's okay to not be okay. And that phrase is sort of starting to have wider use in, in, in um, kind of mental health circles too. Um, but I think normalizing, there's a lot of things we have to normalize because we still wanna believe West Virginia is not alone in this. I, I have two other states that I, I work with, Ohio and Indiana, but um, we still want to believe that drug users are others and that, and that addicts are others, and they're not. They're us. They're my stepfather. They're my brother. They're friends of mine who I went to college with. They're friends of mine who didn't go to college, who feel like that's their big trauma in life. Drug users are not others. 
Um, and so we really need to normalize harm reduction as this much broader conversation. I, I understand the, the roots of it. And Robin, I appreciate, you know, the history you have of um, a time when it, all it meant was syringe exchange and that, that totally has merit. And, and someone used this, uh, a very similar phrase earlier, but we, in my business, we always say uh, all Narcan is naloxone, but not all naloxone is Narcan. We love that phrase because we think all naloxone is good naloxone, whether you're getting it intramuscularly, intravenously, through your nose, wherever you're getting it, because it's a benign product. It can't hurt anybody without opiates being on board. And it should be in everyone's home, just like a fire, a smoke detector, just like um, a fire extinguisher. Um, it belongs everywhere because everyone is going to be touched by this. And I've told this story many, many times, but I can't say it enough. The U.S. or former U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams, when he speaks in front of a group of people, always tries to let people know you are going to come across a person who needs naloxone recovery from an opiate overdose, accidental or not, before you ever come across someone who needs, who needs hands-on CPR training. So we have to normalize every home having Narcan or naloxone, whatever format you want to have it in, every mother's purse having it, every school system, every library, every public building. No one would have believed 20 years ago that they, we would have defibrillators on a wall or in a bag on an airplane that anybody could take out and shock someone back to life. But by God, we have them. And we have them because there was a need that we didn't have them and somebody died and they shouldn't have died. And I'm telling you, people are dying every day because someone doesn't have Narcan in their car, in their purse, on their person, in their backpack. And it's not right. And I don't wanna normalize death. I wanna normalize freaking use. These are not others. These are people we know. Maybe it's not intravenously. I don't know why we still have to like, we want to stratify drug use. Like we want to say, it's okay to get shit based. Oh, sorry. Like it's okay. Hey, 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 sorry. hey, hey. But it's okay that everybody drank too much yesterday because it was Super Bowl Sunday and beer, you know, sponsored the damn thing. So that's okay. That's okay. But, but it's not okay. None of it's okay. So let's stop. If we can stop thinking it's other people, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir, you guys, but like, ah, we've got to normalize this. We've got to normalize that, that it's not just somebody who accidentally takes their pain medication the wrong way or takes their pain medication and adds a benzo and doesn't realize it's not just somebody who's, you know, sh sh when I talk with kids about sexual assault, there's so many analogies because they still believe the rape myth. When you ask a group of eighth graders who commits rape, it's a man, it's in a dark alley, it's late at night, she's drunk, she's in a short skirt. They still believe that and it makes me sick. And there's people on here who still believe that drug users are others. And we've got to stop because if we don't think different and we're the best we've got to fight this stuff, we're, we're missing the mark. I'm sorry, I know I sound like a proselytizer, but I get real worked up. I mean, I think that, thank, thanks. I, I mean, you know, I think that the other piece of it, like I said, for me, harm reduction is on a continuum. I feel like we still don't talk about what used to be called in our business, ATOD, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, right? We don't talk about where those addictive personality traits fall on a continuum of care. Uh, what are we going to do about alcoholism, you know, liver disease, viral hepatitis, you know, I mean, when we talk about Hep C, you know, we most people just think of it uh, as its as a relationship to it, to injection drug use. We don't talk about its relationship to to alcoholism and and what did that what does that mean, right? So I, I, I oh my God, Laura Jones, you made it! Oh my God, everybody was talking about you earlier. You missed it. Like fifteen people were like, "Where's your Laura Jones?" She's a queen. She's a god. I mean, it, they went on and on and on. So you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making it. Um, but I think that I think that one of the, the important things that we have to do is to be able to figure out 
you know, like I say, you know, kind of, again, how that this is a community approach, not an other's approach. Uh, you know, yes, there's a place, there's room and space for people who use drugs. Yes, there's room and space for people who say, no, not in my community, but we've got to be able to do this all together. Laura Jones, how you doing? You're on mute, but you know, I mean, I appreciate hearing you. Other than that, I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah. So Laura, tell me, tell me what, what are the top issues for harm reduction in the state of West Virginia? Uh, the number one issue is, is expanding harm reduction in the state of West Virginia. Um, Expanding harm reduction or expanding needle exchange? You are here for, we make, we're, we're making distinctions. We're using our words. Uh, are we talking about more harm reduction or are we talking about more needle exchange? Uh, when, I, when I talk about harm reduction, I'm, I'm including the concept of syringe access, not exchange, access. So um, I, I think both of those things need to be expanded in West Virginia to rural areas, to um, some of our larger, more urban areas. And we've got to do something about the stigma surrounding syringe access and harm reduction for people who use drugs. Um, there's no question about it that we're going to continue to be under attack until there's a better understanding in our state about um, harm reduction and why it works and how it works and why it's an evidence-based practice. Okay, so, so- I apologize for missing everything that went before that. But. It's okay, you know, you know, usually when I say half of people don't hear half of what I say anyway. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm gonna do something which some people may or may not d agree with, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, Ashley, where are you? Are you are you on camera somewhere, Ashley? My camera is not on. Uh, can you get on? Uh, can you get on to the uh, oh, unmute at least? Because Ashley, you I, I, let me try. Okay. So and the reason I'm asking, Ashley, is because uh, I think you have very strong opinions, right? And so I want, I want people to hear from you what you think, and, I'm, and, I, and I want you to, uh, hopefully you can still hear me, but what I want you to do is, is tell us what you think the top three barriers are to you thinking harm reduction and needle exchange are good things. What are, what are the barriers to that? I'll come on in five minutes uh, without my mute on. Okay, so you'll be back heading to my car. Okay, all right. So she'll come back in five minutes and tell us because I think, it, I think it's important. I think it's really important to figure out kind of what are other people thinking uh, um, uh, I don't, Ron, Ron just said something about kicking out some people. I don't know what happened, Ron. I, I have no idea. So, uh, Ron, do you want to get on and tell us what, what just happened? I'm not sure what happened. I'm, I'm here. Where's Ron? Who is Ron? Tell, I can tell you, Tony, there's two people who have been removed. They've been kicked out of the Zoom call. Those uh -huh. are people with lived experience of drug use but we're giving a platform to someone who's had some really problematic behavior towards many of the people on the call. So okay. I think it's what the, what the issue is. Okay. So I don't know who the two people I am unmuted now. I'm sorry. All right. So, all right, Ashley, Marcus, uh, I don't know who the two people are. Is it a way to email them, call them or try to get them back on so that we can certainly hear from them as well. All right, go ahead, Ashley. Okay, could you repeat what, what, what you asked me just a minute ago? I'm sorry. Short version is, can you give me the top three things that are you believe are your barriers mm -hmm. to seeing mm -hmm. harm reduction mm -hmm. as a viable public health tool? 
Okay, well, yes. Um, I actually wasn't clear on the harm reduction versus the needle exchange issue or the, the syringe service programs. Um, and so I asked, can you have a harm reduction without um, handing out needles? I think that's, I think that needle, that component, um, that uh, needle giveaway or the needle exchanges or whatever you want to call them is um, very problematic in a community um, as small as ours. I think that it um, goes hand in hand with criminal drug use. I mean, am I right about that? Is that the, the main reason why that people would come and get needles would be to inject, um, you know, criminal, uh, criminal drugs. Well, I mean, I mean, okay, so, let, so let, I guess maybe even we can stop right there, right? Okay, okay so because I, I think even that frame, right, mm -hmm. is, is, right. An interesting, is an interesting frame. So okay. people, you, people come to a syringe access program as Laura and Stephanie just talked about moments ago, because they need, they want access to clean, safe uh, materials and work. So as not to do a couple of things. One, to not transmit HIV, not transmit viral hepatitis, mm -hmm. uh, not to transmit uh, other diseases. Also to reduce the number of uh, likely uh, abscesses and, and other uh, infectious diseases that can occur from injecting drug use. So I think that the, the, the idea that you put this criminalization frame on it okay. from the outset is, is I think a bit, maybe, maybe a bit challenging uh, for some po folks. Okay, that's fair. But I mean, but is that what is going on though? I mean, is that what the needles are for? Yes, that's okay. exactly what they're for. for. Okay. They're, they're, used, they're used for sound public health. You can read many, many publications on the viability of syringe access as okay. a- yeah. so Just how should I say that so that it wouldn't be offensive, but even syringe though- Syringe access, uh, maybe, maybe okay. let's start with syringe access. If we do nothing else today, oh. let's get you out of here with syringe okay. access is what we're all seeking to achieve. Okay, so syringe access, I have to leave out the other part. But, you know, so, but, so let me. But here's that the you're talked about HIV and and the spread of diseases, and I get that too. But I think one of the things that we're failing to look at, I don't really think you can leave out really the criminalization part of it because you I can you can if you choose to. Well, but I mean, you have to also look at the effects of criminal drug use on uh, the effects on a society as a whole. I would think. Well, you well, then we could also then have a conversation about the number of DUIs in the state. Mm -hmm. We could also have a conversation about the, the number of, yeah. of black lung uh, fatalities in the state over many decades. We could also have, I mean, we-, we But we, DUIs are punishable. I mean, people do, when they, when they are found driving with, under the influence, it's punishable. And, and, and people who use drugs get, get penalized by the law also. So right. it's, it's not so, everyone using drugs. Okay. Is I, I just don't think you can so, cancel. Right, so, I, I know that you okay, don't so want to use that part let, about the, criminal, let the Laura, criminal my part friend, of it. I'm going to let my Laura, my good friend and queen okay. of harm reduction uh, come in. So if you go back on mute and then go ahead, Laura. Okay, great. So um, I think what we're, the, the, the person who's the end user who is actually addicted to a substance is not necessarily the focus of criminal activity. The, the persons that we want to focus on are the people that are manufacturing, selling, um, and bringing drugs into our country. So the, the people that are actually using heroin are people who are addicted to a substance like they would be addicted to alcohol and they need help, not criminalization. Sending people to jail is not a helpful way of helping them into recovery. So that's part of what we're looking at from a harm reduction point of view is what can we do to reduce harm to this person? 
what can we help them do to reduce harm to themselves until they're ready for treatment? The, the addiction part of, of heroin in particular and fentanyl and other drugs is, is takes away your ability to think about much of anything else. Um, and so you tend to do things that are potentially harmful to yourself. And by being able to access a harm reduction program with syringe access, because that's the thing that people actually need to protect themselves is the, the clean syringes. That's the way that we are able to develop relationships with people and help them find hope in what's going on and, and reach eventually towards something other than addiction. That's gonna look differently for everyone. And whether they eventually get to recovery will be different for everyone. But if we don't have some kind of face-to-face -face interaction or relationship with people, then we don't get anywhere. And we don't get Narcan out there in a manner that it needs to be um, distributed. So that's part of what, where we're coming from. So Laura, thank you very it much. It wasn't, wasn't very eloquent, but. <laughs> but I mean, but I think that, that that's exactly, I think that that's exactly it though, right? So I think that some people uh, tend to want to stick with the criminalization of the drug user and say, put them in jail or say, well, let them die or let them OD. I, I mean, I think that I think that we have to be very honest and very transparent about uh, whether or not um, that is, uh, you know, that's how some people think. Well, um, I mean, I don't think that. I, would, does anybody feel like there are any negative effects to a community with these types of programs if they're unregulated or if they're? You but, know, okay, so actually, like to say something if I can, please. Yes, yes, Councilwoman McKinney. Okay, because I've been listening for a while and I'm listening to everyone. And the thing that gets to me is that I am African-American. I am a 70s baby. So all of the concern and care was needed way back then. Yes. And that, now that we have it, to single it, to just one component, I think is the, the biggest problem that I, I, I see. Like we're talking about needles, 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 but I have not heard no one, not one person this whole time we've been on this call since two o'clock speak on the trauma that causes people to use drugs. Exactly. So we, we don't even address, we're not even addressing the bigger problem. We're just trying to see how to make it easy how to fix it for the loved ones that's around us because we feeling bad for them. Now we understand it's an illness. Now we see, let's find a way to help. But how is it that nobody has said anything about the traumas that cause people to use drugs? So until you address the traumas that is causing people to use drugs, how do you expect anybody to heal? And then when you speak on harm reduction, it, and I say harm reduction for all because what about the drug dealers? What about those who have to sell drugs to survive? Mm -hmm. What about the drug dealer that's out there selling drugs to the same people you saying, here, go get a clean needle so you get high clean and, and don't spread nothing. So it's still permission. It's still, it's still a, another way of not addressing the problem. So, I mean, like, if we're going to talk about harm reduction, I would please stop saying just needle shake, needle shake, because it's a bigger thing than just needles. I, Needles is just a small piece of this of this conversation. It should be just a small piece of the conversation if it's about trying to figure out how we really look up this thing of harm. Because I've been doing research and it started in another country. So I know it's, it's brand new to us. So I think that we need to really think about what do harm reduction mean to you? Because as an African-American, it hurts to know that I still deal with these kids every day that is 
was separated from the crack epidemic. Mothers still don't have their mind right because of the crack epidemic. You got felons, people that can't get jobs, people that can't feed their families. So we didn't get this consideration. We didn't get this care. The African-American community was hit very hard. We mm-hmm. died from HIV. Nobody said nothing. Mm-hmm. There was nothing said. So, I mean, to hear this in 2021, like, and, and to even be a part of this conversation, I pray that we actually do the right thing because it's bigger than just a needle exchange. It's bigger than uh, politics. This is really about people and lives. Mm-hmm. And we really need to know when we say harm reduction, are we really mean a harm reduction for everybody? Or are we only saying harm reduction for what we saying we agree with? Because it's bigger than just, you know, what I'm hearing. And I've been on this call for a minute. And like I said, I haven't heard nobody say anything about trauma, what's causing this. How do we stop them from even thinking about, like, meeting them where they are? I mean, it's cool and all of that when you get the relationship. But how do we actually help them heal? How do we get them off the drugs, for real? Right. And and I, Councilwoman uh, McKinney, I think that you actually uh, articulate exactly what I was saying earlier, is that this is a continuum. This is not just injection drug use. This starts with behavioral health, mental health, substance use, alcohol, tobacco, other drugs. And I, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, I don't know if you can see me, uh, but I am also African-American. And, uh, and I believe and agree with you 100% that in harm reduction, we don't talk often about the impact of crack or now that we wanna move things to a disability. What are we gonna do about the black and brown people that are locked up that are incarcerated behind this? So I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I wanna be 100% clear. I do not think that you are alone in uh, your uh, understanding and awareness. And I think that that's why I think using language around access uh, to behavioral health services, access to harm reduction services that are on a continuum are completely important. Lisa has asked me 15 times uh, to let her share her own experience and I'm gonna do that. So go ahead, Lisa. Thank you so much, Tony. And I, again, I, I just moved back from North Carolina after being gone for 13 years, but maybe to help Ashley understand. So I worked as an LPN, licensed practical nurse for 12 years. I was in a pretty horrific car accident in 2013, um, almost lost my life and became addicted to prescription pain medication. Um, I went back to work sooner than what I should have. I was in complete denial and there was other traumas. Speaking of traumas, I'm a big motivator with adverse childhood experiences. Dr. Gabor Mate is a very, look up some of his uh, videos and TED Talks, a wonderful um, physician who has actually a uh, injection clinic in Canada. Um, But to stay on on my story, criminalization of of drug use. So I began calling in my own prescription pain medication. Um, When my mother found the second bottle, she turned me into the Rowan County Sheriff's Department in North Carolina. Um, The detective called me while I was at work and asked me to come to speak to him about, you know, the reports that my mother had made and they had already ran the DA reports. They saw you know, they had done their homework by that point and, and knew that I had been calling in these prescriptions illegally. Um, when I went to meet this man, he shared with me that his daughter is in recovery from a heroin addiction. He shared with me his story about how he had to raise his grandchildren. And he asked me about my boys and he took the time to see me as a person and not the crime. And he actually gave me time to tell my family that I was gonna be arrested, that I was facing 20 felony charges. Um, He actually took the time for me to to make arrangements for my kids and turn myself in a couple of days later because he was concerned about what my children saw. In, in, In the midst of all this, I did lose my nursing license and I went back to school to become an alcohol and drug counselor and and I got a degree in human services. But I will tell you this, five years later, I had an opportunity to to meet this detective again. And he came and spoke in one of the groups in North Carolina, I worked at a treatment center and he spoke to the clients that I serve. 
And if that general, if that detective would have approached me in any different manner than seeing me as a human being and not a criminal, I don't know that I would be here today where I am. He was that first point of contact for me. And the person who makes that first point of contact for a person who is at their lowest in life is it. I cannot tell you the impact that you, you can have on someone's life. What I'm saying is, is if we meet people where they are and remove, you know, remove your beliefs and try to step in their shoes, which is what he did for me. I had the opportunity to thank him. Um, and today I still stay in contact with him. And to say that I have an ally of the, the detective who arrested me, you know, speaks volumes. And, and I just, again, what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make is, is sometimes we have to remove ourselves and our minds from these situations. Um, we need to look at people again, not from a criminal aspect, but I in no way, I didn't, I didn't want to be doing those things, but you know what I told him? I didn't know how to stop. Um, you know, and I was just like everybody else um, in a lot of ways before my addiction. I had a very bad mindset about it. You know, I stigmatized people until it happened to me. Um, but I, again, you know, trying to criminalize um, or stigmatize, it's not going to help individuals. And when you, just like Laura was saying, you know, when we have that opportunity to, to be that first point of contact with someone and to try to reach them, not on a level of maybe even trying to get them in recovery, but trying to reduce the harm from disease, you know, from taxpayers, saving the, um, the communities and the taxpayers money from maybe unnecessary ambulance trips to the hospital or having to treat them from hepatitis or HIV. You know, you have to look at the greater levels of, of, of harm reduction itself. But um, it, it, you know, stirred my emotions when I heard the, the whole criminal aspect. And I can speak for myself and say that treating people as the, what they're doing instead of who they are will never work. And that's all I'm gonna say. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you, Lisa. And I and I so I think that it's also important to to hear that experience. And I think that you know there might be people of color who say I had a very different experience that I was immediately arrested. I was you know I was not given those sort of options. So Absolutely. I think it's important that we are making sure that we put it again. And the word I want to bring us all back to is equity. That we're, that we're that we're developing programs that are that are equitable, where people of color are getting arrested for small drugs or large uh, doses, uh, having drugs on them or paraphernalia on them at a higher rate than, than other communities. And I, so, hey Sarah, can I ask a question? Why are you on this call? Who are you? I just hey, want to. Yeah, you, Sarah. I'm a sore. Okay. I'm I I'm a person you. in. Um, abstinence face recovery who's been shown a lot of grace and I'm a I'm a person with sore okay I just I just wanted I mean because we spent a lot of time on Austin and I was like you know that was and I and I and I know parents uh, particularly new parents hate that when the baby gets all the attention and no one has cared and one I like no matter who I am turn the baby around so I wanted to make sure that we definitely uh, spoke to you and, and, and figured that out. Um, and I got a note that, uh, is it Nikisha? Nikisha Cabell, are you back? Yes, ma'am, that, yes. And so you, so why did you, no, okay, you, they say you, you say you got kicked out. Why'd you get kicked out of the call? I have no idea. Um, it popped up on my screen. I was under my lead PRC's name on there because I wasn't able to log on. I've actually been attending these for uh, a little while now. I'm a peer recovery coach for Ascension's Peer Recovery Services, and I enjoy sitting in and listening to all the different, you know, views and everything. And I can relate to some things that have been shared as um, being a woman of color. Um, a person in recovery, someone who was never given the chance to try to beat this, get ahead of this disease with the opportunity of being offered rehab. 
not even when I my my daughter was born chemically dependent on um, drugs. I never got the opportunity to go to re rehab. I am also an individual who has went to prison f uh, three times and served four and a half years, and that did not help me. I participated in the RSAP program twice, opened the one in Southwestern Regional Jail. I helped open that up and um, I learned a lot of great things, but it was more effective for me to go to treatment, learn, learn tools and coping mechanisms to be able to get ahead of this disease. Um, being incarcerated, you can, you have just as much, much access to drugs on the inside as you do on the out. Uh, I am here to first tell you that um, locking people up does not solve this does not solve the issue because you have these programs where you can participate with them inside. But what happens is you have all the tools, but you have not been able to practice them effectively because um, being locked up and being out in the real world and trying to trans transition to become a productive member of society, you do not get the practice while you are locked up. Thank you, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll get Marcus later. I'll beat him with a wet noodle. I don't know why you got uh, kicked out. Look at Keely was like, you gonna beat him with what? A wet, just a wet noodle. That's all. Uh, I'll beat him with a wet noodle. Uh, but thank you, thank you for coming back. Uh, I think that we have one other person. Uh, I don't know. I think it was Lyra. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Did you make it back? I don't know if you did. Um, I don't, I don't hear Lyra. So, hey, Brooke, are you still there or did Brooke leave? She's listening. I'm not sure that she can answer right now. She's at work. Okay. She, she's on her job job. Yeah. I, I understand that. So let me go. Hey, hey, Mike, let me, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, I want to come back to you about, uh, is it better? Do you think it's better for us to be proactive uh, and have some legislation ready, or just as I think as Barbara said earlier, to be uh, reactive in the case of a, of a new TAR bill or something like that? First, right when you were calling, I was getting ready. I was right, typing something in the, in the chat. Oh, okay. I was thanking Nikisha for what she just said, because it got me thinking that a lot of time, and it was something that Deanna had said earlier, I feel a lot of times that recovery programs, treatment programs in West Virginia are a lot less diverse than our, than even the makeup of the state. And a lot of times the problem might rely with our prosecutor's offices and our legal system where people don't get the chance. They don't get the, the, the diversion that other folks do, uh, meaning uh, alternative sentencing, uh, sending somebody to drug court. Uh, sometimes it's a pipeline straight to jail or prison. And that's the, that's a problem that also needs to be addressed uh, with our with our legal system. As far as being proactive, look, I'll be honest. I think with the recent with the makeup of the legislature here, I think we're going to find ourselves being more reactive uh, since we have a a a, a new supermajority here. I think a lot of uh, unfortunately a lot of politics uh, are reactive these days. Um, now that would, so, and, and I also with, as far as like you talked earlier about a litter cleanup program, it's like, you know, the city of Charleston has several, um, more than several a year where they have what I think it's called team up cleanup. It's just not just about syringe litter, litter in general. I think cities should be doing that. I'm not sure if the state should be uh, mandating uh, how municipalities or counties uh, do their litter cleanup, I guess. Small, call me a, a small government conservative on this issue, um, but I think that should be left at the local level. Um, but where the state sh should be getting involved uh, is what we've done so far with expanding access to Narcan um, and doing more with the, the public relations, public information behind the Good Samaritan program. And I know this is about harm reduction, but it was brought up. Why aren't we talking about the root causes of it? The state could be doing a better job of addressing uh, ACEs. What was brought up earlier. And that if, that's what we really. That's what the state should really be in the business of doing. We're in the poorest state in the country. Uh, 
poverty, isolation, depression, all these things uh, lead to the, the reason why our little state is right at the, the epicenter of the, the worst drug problem in the country. So that's what the legislature would better serve doing is looking at the root causes, looking at real prevention, when real prevention often doesn't involve drugs at all. It's about addressing poverty and about addressing adverse childhood experiences. So that's what I think we, we should be doing. Is, um, and, and we'll deal with the, you know, the bill from TAR and the bill from MANT uh, if, they're, if they're placed on an agenda. Um, so let me, let me, uh, uh, Susan, are you, did you want to, you have a question? Okay. Okay. Can we I, want just, to I just wanted to add two things to what Delegate Pushkin said. Okay. Um, one of those is that there will be an AFA coming out from DHHR Office of Drug Control Policy um, for syringe cleanup throughout the state. And so many of us on this call are aware and waiting for that because we plan to collaborate together on that issue, which will not just involve needle pickup, but could involve um, buying needle resistant gloves for sanitation workers, educating the public about syringe cleanup and how to properly pick up syringes, et cetera. So that, that's one thing that I just wanna make sure everybody on the call um, is aware of. We also in Kanawha County do have a syringe box outside of our Charleston Kanawha Health Department. Um, we would like there to be more and I know SOAR is working on that as well. Um, so we're going to have some opportunities to do things at the local level in regard to syringe cleanup and I think that that's super important just for everybody on the call to know. Right. I think, you know, I think that there's also another one of those mailboxes in storage. Ask Dr. Kilkenny about it. I believe that there are two, and those are conversations that we have been having. Um, I know that Brooke and I just recently had that conversation. So okay. yeah, because I knew I knew that there was one. Okay, so there's two, there's two in storage. Um, and so Councilwoman McKenney. I think that if I'm hearing what Dr. Bissett is saying, uh, uh, right, that there's going to be an RFA for community cleanup coming out, I would think that that would be an opportunity maybe for some of your organizations, faith groups and others that are in the community to apply for some of that money. And, um, you know, what I can commit to is that if you want somebody to help you with writing the grant or responding, CEG will, will, will commit some time and energy to helping you guys do that down there. Um, because I, I don't, you know, I, but I think that, that that's, there should be a diversity of who's doing those cleanups, getting new communities involved in harm reduction in, in a new way. Uh, and so that might, that might be an opportunity to engage in a, in a, in a new way. Um, I, I think that the, the other thing that I really want to talk about, uh, which nobody ever likes to talk about except for me, is the opioid treatment moratorium. The moratorium on the number of methadone licenses we have in this state. So somebody help me understand why we only have uh, two providers, one with seven licenses and one with two. Uh, and uh, I, I just don't think that that's a good thing. I think we need more methadone. Go ahead. Well, uh, that was a state law that was passed before, it was before I was in office. And um, I know that Barbara had to get off the phone. Um, and she was, she probably could explain it better. I think at the time, that was more along the lines of what was needed. That was uh, also a very long time ago when that moratorium was placed. There is no moratorium on buprenorphine. Correct. The more, because it didn't exist at the time the bill was passed, first of all. It, it might have existed, but it wasn't like it, it was not like it is today with all the, so you'll see there's, you know, uh, buprenorphine clinics, all, you know, lots, many of them, and there's only like, what, there are nine methadone? Nine, right. So, now, so in how my day job, I do non-emergency medical transport. Okay. okay. Expanded Medicaid to cover drug treatment a couple years ago, and that also includes transportation. I think it would be smart policy on the state's part to expand uh, access to to methadone because right now what we're doing, I can tell you this because it's my day job, we're we're driving people all over the state daily. Um, it would be it would be better. Uh, for, for everyone if there was if there was more access in their community to it. 
so what? Okay, so to look like better. That's one more thing. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, no. But the the license the the body of uh, the part of the DHHR that that is supposed to govern um, that looks over licensed behavioral health and, and as well as suboxone clinics and methadone clinics is OFLAC. They're woefully underfunded and understaffed. They're not able to regulate uh, what we do have. I do think if we are going to expand it, we have to make sure that they are clean and that the patients there are treated uh, like they're going to a medical facility, like they're treated like patients and not herded in like cattle. So okay. in order to do that, we're gonna have to better fund OFLAC and make sure they have the staff to regulate it. All right, so what what would you, what would you, cause you know, this is, like I said, it's my call. So I get to, to my party, I can cry if I wanna. Um, you know, that uh, what do I need to do to get uh, more people like you to get ready to overturn the, the moratorium on, on methadone, basically? Well, I think if we approach it from what I just said, what we're spending money on now with the transportation, I think that would be a good argument to make in this current legislature, because I, can, I know we're spending Medicaid, spending a lot of money um, to uh, pick people, and they have to go daily. Like they don't have take homes; they're going every single morning. Correct. We are, we're. There's a whole new industry has sprung up around transporting people each morning to the methadone clinic, and some of them live very far away uh, from the nearest methadone clinic. Some of them have been kicked out of their local methadone clinic and have to travel to one half, you know, half the state away. Right. And, and Mike, this is Mike. This is Jim Smallridge. There, there's uh, there, there's not enough. There's also not enough non-medical transport uh, available if you're going to take people across the state. There's not enough people to do it. Well, there's more and more of it uh, that has sprung up. And several years ago, we deregulated it, deregulated right. it, so people can sign up to be a med non-emergency medical transport driver. Um, there's plenty of business in it. Uh, so the, the opportunity is there. Anybody can sign up for it as long as they have you know, the car and the background check. Yeah, but we, we run into that all the time that we don't, that, you know, that, that people complain for, for all reasons, just don't have enough. There's just not enough people doing it. Right. So thanks. And so Jim, what do you think about this overturning the the opioid treatment uh, moratorium. Can you see what I? You can see what I want to do in twenty twenty one. Yeah, I, I think I, I think Tony. Um, you know, I, I think it's absolutely worth exploring. You know that 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 you know that that obviously what's going on now isn't isn't working. Uh, so we we've got to find better solutions. I mean, there there's it's so multi. Um, multifaceted and and it was great to hear from from Lisa too because I'm I'm a nurse and and I I was just sitting here thinking the the nurses that I have known uh, that that have lost their licenses or are dead uh, be, because of the ease of access and and lack of treatment and um, you know I, I I've been in it for almost 30 years and I can't tell you how many people that I've worked with that that are no longer with us. And these are not, these are not, you know, guys hanging out on the corner. These are professional people. And I think that we need to, I think we need to paint everybody with that same brush, whether they are low income people of color or, or professionals working in the high rise. I mean, everybody needs to, when it comes to, to the, the problem with addiction, and I know that may seem like an easier task than it than it is, and I know it is, but these people need to be treated, the folks who are facing addiction need to be treated like an illness, not not criminally. Agreed. Uh, so I'm looking, I'm looking around. Oh, Brooke, Brooke, you made it, you made it back. And and I got and I, I'm gonna come to Brooke and then I'm gonna come to Amy Snodgrass. And to Brianna to talk a bit about ACES. I don't know if anybody from the ACES coalition is on here, uh, but if they if they could, uh, I okay, that's good. Transportation. I didn't. We didn't talk about transportation as a the big barrier. But thanks, Mike, for telling us about the fact that folks can um, get in that transport business if they want to. Uh, is is that how do they do it, Mike? 
They would go through a uh, company called Logistic Care that has the contract with the DHHR to do non-emergency medical transports for Medicaid. Okay. So, all right. And so I come back to you again, uh, Councilwoman McKinney. That's another thing I think where you can find uh, maybe an opportunity for small minority owned businesses to, to spring up across the state to do that sort of non-medical emergency transport. Um, but so Brooke, I'm gonna go to you. And then I had, I had a whole list in my head and then I got distracted. Brooke needs you to go to Stacy in lieu of her. Okay, okay, Brooke needs, oh, so I will, I'm, instead of going to Stacy then, I'm gonna go to Amy Snodgrass. I'm gonna go to Brianna. I'm gonna see if anybody else is on about, um, uh, from about ACES or anyone from the ACES coalition. I, you know, I, mean, I, my name's Amy. I'm in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Yeah, I just want to do a plug for the ACES coalition. They meet monthly and they're addressing a lot of, you know, the underlying issues of childhood trauma in relation to substance use disorder. So it's an awesome, awesome group. What else would you like, Tony, about that? I'll put it, I'll put it in the chat right here. Okay, that'd be that'd be perfect. There you if, go. Yep. So I mean, and so and I think that if you want to uh, use ACES, if you want, you can get an ACES one-on-one -on -one training. Uh, if you want to have ACES be as a, a through line through your programs, uh, you can do that. Uh, I don't know if John Kennedy is on from the Washington Primary Care Association, mean, Washington, woo, West Virginia Primary Care Association, uh, or not. Okay. Tony, so look, back, I'm gonna go ahead. Uh, back to the ACEs real fast. They uh, they have trainers that will do trainings for your organizations. So if you if you want to uh, include that in in the work that you do, uh, that would that would be great. I'm taking a quick look around to see who else is here. Uh, oh hey, we've got the uh, hey Luann, Can you tell us kind of like about Teen Court? and how Teen Court is addressing, um, particularly with the young people. Uh, I mean, are there any, what are you seeing there as far as harm reduction, access to syringe access and all of that good stuff? Well, hi, Tony, how are Hello. you? How are you? Um, I'm good. Uh, okay, so she caught me off guard here. Um, I'm with the Berkeley County Teen Court, and we're kind of working real close right now with the Jefferson County Teen Court, where the two of us are kind of going hand in hand right now. Um, actually, Tony, to be perfectly honest with you, the kids are not talking, my group, Berkeley County group, is not really talking much about the drug situation. They're, they're you know, for lack of better words, they're like your A plus students. They're they're, they're not into that scene. I mean, I can barely get them to stay on Facebook long enough to look at a message, but um, it, it's, it's not a big conversation with them. And the Berkeley County Teen Court doesn't do um, um, teen drug cases. Now, Jefferson County Teen Court does do teen drug cases. So with us helping them out, our team in Berkeley County has really had a lot of exposure to the, the charges, the possession charges, but mostly what we're seeing is just the marijuana. Um, the biggest thing on their part is they're questioning why one youth would be charged with a simple charge of possession when there's so many things that another student who's charged the same way had more of. So where you find one student had a little baggie of some, some marijuana in a vehicle and they were charged with um, uh, possession of marijuana, where you might find another student who, or two students, I'll use two students, there was two of them together, where they found in the vehicle, not only a bag of marijuana, but a couple jars with marijuana, some vape products, and some wax which at the time I'm very naive, I'm sorry. I didn't know what that meant. I had to get one of the kids to explain to me what the wax part of it was. But, you know, so that's about the only thing what that we're dealing with. What was the wax? It is, and, and if anybody wants to correct me if I say it wrong, it is a stronger form. 
it's a it's it's wax, but it's it's something that is used with the vape, if I'm not mistaking, to make the marijuana more potent. Am I correct? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I see a hand going, yes, I did it. Well, yes, got, thank I, you, Lisa. <laughs> thank I got you. A concentrated THC. Dabs, dabs. Yes. The wax. Yes. So as far as harm reduction and the needles, we're, we're, there's just no conversation there. Have I put that on their plate? No, I have not. Well, what about, let me ask you this. And I think I'm asking you because I, you know, again, I, I, I come to this and I always say, it's like, I might not change your mind uh, intellectually, but I, hopefully I can change your heart by making this about you, your family, your community, your grandma. Um, so, but aren't they seeing um, this level of drug use in their families? Because many of them are still uh, in homes where it's multi-generational. It's not just them. It's them and usually a grandparent or aunt and uncle. Okay. Now, Tony, in, in answer to that, not the team themselves, but our offenders. Yes, our offenders, when they come in, and I, I hear just about every meeting about the ACEs. When you stop and work with the offenders, now these are all kids under the eight, age of 18. Um, a couple of mine are like 12 and 14 years old. But when, you, when our defense attorneys talk with these kids, you find out that they were introduced to these things because of what's in the home. The ACEs, the, the, the single parents, the uh, grandparents as parents, the, you know, the, the list just goes on. And yes, when you talk to the offenders and you really start getting into their personal business, you're going to find out that there's quite a bit of drug use in the background. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Joanne. Luann. Why do I always want to call you Joanne? You know, you know I, I, I use this flavoring and it's Joanne and it's so sweet, just like you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You can call me anything but Lou. I don't like Lou. Lou's a short, fat, bald headed man with a cigar. So there we go. All right. All right. We have about uh, six minutes left. Uh, first and, mo and first and foremost, I want to thank all of my uh, my guests that rode this ride with me. Uh, I want to say that we fully uh, respect and engage with people uh, who use drugs in the organizations that represent them. We believe that there should be an equity, and particularly a health equity lens, uh, placed on to harm reduction. Um, uh, I second the book recommendation. Oh, somebody's recommending a book in the chat. So look, does anybody have anything last minute? Mike, everybody should call your personal cell number after 10 p.m. Is that right? I'll put it in the chat. They can call anytime. All right. Um, Thank you for having me on. I just want to say I've come a long way on the issue. As somebody who is in recovery, I am went through, you know, I'm a 12-step product of 12-step recovery. That's what I firmly believe in. I realize that not everybody recovers the same way or at the same rate. I still think, though, that abstinence should be the ultimate goal. Thanks, Mike. And, and I think, again, I think that that's why we want to design and should design a continuum of care for, for harm reduction, a continuum of care for recovery, so that everyone on that continuum, whether you're uh, you know, still drinking, not drinking, were drinking, or drinking and went to rehab, or taking um, medication and not drink. Wherever you are on this continuum, if it's a, a continuum of injection drug use, um, you know, I think that we all have to have options in our lives, and we certainly should have uh, the opportunity to support people who are in need and we have to provide access for them. Um, so, uh, oh look, there you go, Ashley. Nobody knew what you look like. Now, see, now they can all see you. You might not want, you might want to go back on that, uh, turn that camera off so they can't find you, but I'm just saying. <laughs> um, just a joke, just a joke, people, just a joke. Uh, so anybody else, have, and there's Mike Pushkin's number down in the chat. Do not call this man after 7 p.m. Do not call this man at the 7. Listen, don't start, Mike. Don't. Do, I'm helping you. 10:30. Huh? Larry David said the rule is 10:30. 10:30. 10:30. 
10 30 all right okay don't call me after seven and so, tony yes this is free just one more thing that i would add is that i i appreciate everybody's openness and um, identifying things that are barriers. And as we think about, you know, programs to help individuals around harm reduction and access, we need to think about the systems changes and the policy changes that go with that. And, you know, the ACEs highlights that that's kind of been the topic today. I um, mean, I appreciate uh, Delegate Pushkin's reference to OFLAC and, and underfunding and just the understaffing that creates challenges in, in terms of trying to be able to increase capacity to keep up with need, um, especially in the middle of an epidemic. And I appreciate these conversations and I look forward to being uh, part of these as they go forward. Thanks. And that, thanks Bree. And that's exactly what this was, was a, as a conversation. Uh, sorry to the people who got kicked off, uh, but you know we have to be respectful of, of one another. And I know that that wasn't uh, everyone, so we we hopefully worked that out. Um, and and uh, I want to say everybody owes Austin a dollar, and so there should be like a Dollar Tree, so not not literally not the store Dollar Tree, but a Dollar Tree. Um, somewhere for Austin. And you missed it, Laura. Did you meet Austin? Were you here? Did you? Now, hey, uh, Sarah, can you show uh, this? This is Austin. This um, is hi, Austin. Yes, that is, our, that is now, Austin is now our official mascot. She's mostly not impressed with anything I do. So. I'm sure. <laughs> So again, I, I literally, I want to just thank everyone. Um, we're uh, probably going to follow up with you, Mike, about uh, the OTP moratorium. Um, and again, I want to thank literally everyone that, that took time with us. And I think that this is the beginning of the uh, uh, conversation. Marcus just sent me a note that said, I'm supposed to plug the survey. Uh, we have a survey that's out on uh, rural health care uh, and, and on technical assistance needs. You can get a, you can win a gift card. Uh, you might win one, but you, it's not guaranteed. Uh, yeah. uh, uh oh, and uh, that's it. That's all we got. If you want to get a copy of the survey link, there it is. Everybody have an amazing week. Hopefully we don't get any more snow for a minute. But I think we're supposed to get some more day after tomorrow. We're cool. Anybody with have questions? Call me, uh, email me. Uh, if you want to do it again, call me, email me. Talk to you. Everybody have an amazing week. Thanks, Tony. All right. See ya. Bye, Austin.